Hello and welcome to yet another episode of the Personal Branding for Professionals podcast. Through a series of multiple episodes, I'm at that point of the podcasting journey where I can finally find my voice through the podcast interviews. If you're here for yet another episode, welcome back. Let me take a moment to let you know that I'm very very grateful for your support. On the other hand, if you're new here, um, it's a pleasure to welcome you to this podcast. and through a series of interesting stories and interviews this podcast will connect you to some career development strategies that are actionable and easy to follow and that will in turn connect you to a meaningful career the goal of this podcast is just one to help you get what you truly deserve so i hope that you enjoy this podcast and let me now introduce you to our guest for the day Our guest today is Vidya Srinivasan. She is a senior product manager. She has filed over 21 patents for her work so far and as you can tell, loves building products. Her side hustles include speaking at tech events, leading DNA initiatives and singing. She is a trained Indian classical singer and she is at the honor of being the general chair of the 2019, 2020 and 2021 Greece Opera Conferences. It has always been my dream to invite Vidya to this podcast and it finally finally happens today so i'm very very excited to start this conversation and i know that um, if you are tuning into this episode you have definitely followed her work let us dive in to today's episode which is all about how to be more visible at work as a woman in tech hey vidya welcome to the show Thank you so much for having me, Kirti. Yeah, I I have always uh, dreamt of having you on this podcast, and that day is finally here. So I was just talking about how excited I am to finally host you. I know we've been planning this for a while, and it took a while for our schedules to align. But I'm excited to have you as well. Yeah. So Vidya, we want to talk about your journey as a woman in tech today, as a mom in tech, and we want to cover several aspects about why women uh, don't feel very visible in tech and how what can they do to work on that and what can they do to establish their credibility in the tech industry. So starting mm-hmm. with the first question, you you've been very vocal about the challenges about the unconscious bias that you've faced in the industry over a course of several years. So what would you say are some of the strategies to overcome the unconscious and conscious bias sometimes that women face in tech and what is your journey been like as a woman in tech so far yeah that's a pretty loaded question to be honest so let's let's start with you know the way i think about biases is mm. there is you know bias that others display towards you which can be conscious or unconscious i think there's also a lot of bias that you inherently develop and i think that's where a lot of the gender norms and societal norms and cultural norms come into picture right like for me when i got started i um got an internship offer for my with microsoft and i i i did not even believe that the email was sent to the right person like th- that was that was my my bar because i was like i think this should be a mistake because here i am a grad student in, in a new country i i did not work uh you know between my undergraduate and graduation so this was literally my first you know mm. big company offer if you will and i was like why would they send an internship you know interview offer to me like i i really don't get it like there's far more qualified candidates you know and why would they pick me so mm. i i i started there right i i had mm. to like read the email five times and you know to see if they got the name right or you know <laughs> so th- there was a lot of bias even within myself i would say that yeah you know we call you know some call that imposter syndrome some call that you know um mm. the the inherent you know self doubt cultural norms yeah. and, you know self doubt and cultural norms that that might make you think as someone else as than what you are but um for me i had to work to allow myself give myself the flexibility mm. to experiment yeah and be okay with failing i tried a lot of things in my 10 year career i've been a product manager you know uh for a decade now and and have worked across the enterprise segment small business segment consumer segment um and i had to try a lot of things before mm. i could you know really figure out okay what am i really good at right like what is my quote unquote personal brand if you will yeah right and that took a lot of experimentation and i had to 
and, and, and many times I was the only woman in the room and many mm. times I was the only young woman in the room. You know, here I was like in my early 20s doing all these things and, you know, I was sitting on, on a room with a room full of, you know, in a, or in a panel full of directors and people who had, people whose experience was my age. Yeah. And a lot of times there was a lot of, you know, just narratives in my head that kept going like, I'm really supposed to be here. What if people just laugh at what I'm saying or what if, hmm. you know, I'm not the right person to be sharing such an honorable stage with all these people. And that was all inbuilt because nobody came and told me that you shouldn't be here or nobody came and told me that you're not capable enough to actually speak to an audience like this. So there was a lot of the bias that I just had within my own self because mm -hmm. I never saw anyone else like me do these things before. Yeah. Right. So, so that's why when I said, you know, th there's two parts to it. One was just figuring out and being comfortable with who I am. And allowing myself to experiment enough to figure out who I am and be yeah. okay with failing. So that was the internal part of it. External, I would say, for the most part, I was very fortunate to work in, you know, teams and companies where women were valued, women's opinions are valued. Mm. A lot of the bias I faced is, is actually external because I go and do a lot of public speaking. I go mm. and, you know, I'm very active with the Grace Harper Conference and I've shared their conference three times. And a lot of times, as I mentioned, I was the only woman. I was the youngest mm. right so i'll give you this example when i was you know i was pregnant with my first kid and i went and you know i live in seattle where it, it rains like a lot and mm. i gave and you know went and gave this talk to like 200 something people and i had this person sit in the front row and after the talk she came and you know she was like really observing me and i thought she was really engaged with my talk <laughs> you know I, I like to like read the audience when i'm speaking especially if it is an in-person event and mm -hmm. after the talk she came and told me you know but she was much older woman she was like honey are you really supposed to be here I'm like what do you mean <laughs> and she was like you, you're, like, you're like really pregnant and it's Training, it's not safe to drive. You know, you should be at home caring for yourself and caring for your baby. I, mean, I was, I, it took me a second because I'm like, well, I'm, I don't know, like, I'm glad you care about me, but why should I not be here just because I'm pregnant? Mm. You know, like, are pregnant women not supposed to do certain things? Like, yeah. You know, I don't know who defined these rules. I mean, obviously, I care about myself and my baby, and we're okay. Like, we're perfectly okay. Right? Mm. But, that, that was, you know, it, it's small. So all the small experiences like this. And similarly, when I, when I was pregnant the next time, I got the amazing opportunity to share the Grace Harper Conference. And I always wanted to do it because I thought I was ready for it. But the opportunity came much sooner than, than I anticipated, you know. Yeah. Um, but then I found out I was also pregnant. I, I, you know, accepted the offer. And then I found out I was pregnant. And a lot of people, you know, men and women, advised me with all good intentions but their advice yeah. was all around why are you taking on more things this is the time where you focus on your family this is the time when you're so back yeah right this is the time where you know you you're you don't divide your attention between a lot of different that's happening in fact mm -hmm. many women quit their jobs when they're pregnant and it's all the narratives you know when you keep hearing it over and over you kind of start to believe that oh maybe i am the exception here but yeah. i i'm like no i don't think so i had to really do a lot of thinking to understand do I do I think I will be able to do justice to everything that I have on my plate? My my, my job, my kid, my pregnancy, and my this opportunity of sharing this a very, very coveted conference. And the answer was yes. Right. So when I felt comfortable, the only people who had to be comfortable was me and my husband. Yeah. To be honest. Right. So and we had a we had an open conversation and he was like, Don't you always want to do this? Why are you why are you even questioning it? Right. So it is these type of biases that I am, you know, not comfortable with. Because mm -hmm. it is my my you know narrative is that hey it is up to the women. It's her decision. Man. Yeah, it's it's their decision, right? I don't think we should be imposing what a woman should be doing, you know, um, which might just seem like not the norm. Like just because we haven't seen enough women do these things when they're pregnant doesn't mean that they right. cannot do it. And only if we start doing it, we break all these conversations. And I've had so many people, and I was very vocal about this. I even, you know, uh, co you know I was featured in Forbes for doing this. And a lot of women who read those articles came and told, I'm glad you spoke out because I faced the same thing. You know, I was asked to quit my job by XX, you know, and X because I was pregnant and I had to take a career break. And now I don't want to do that because I always wanted to work. 
right? So I think going back to your original question of what mm-hmm. kind of biases, you know, and what was your strategy, I would say internally, it was just experimenting a lot and allowing mm-hmm. myself to fail and to figure out who I am. Yeah. And there was a lot of, you know, it was a process in itself. I was, because I grew up in a very, you know, traditional South Indian family and where the bar was very high. You know, the bar was really high for what success was, to be honest. Yeah. Right. Like all my cousins, like still our kids went to all amazing colleges, have, you know, kick ass careers. And, you know, so the fear of failure was always there in the sense that, am I okay with failing in these things? But mm-hmm. I, I, then, I guess, you know, my dad always tells me, you'll never know if you're good or bad at it until you try it. Right. So he was always encouraging me to go and like try out these different things. It's okay if you fail. Who are you accountable for? And I had to, you know, really try that out enough number of times to be comfortable with the narrative. Yeah. Right. So that was one. And externally, a, a lot of the bias that I've heard, especially from, you know, not so much from my team or work, but from external, you know, audience would be during the pregnancy phase. And even now as, as a mom, you know, the, the expectation, the societal expectation of what a mom is and mm. what should she be doing is very different than you know, what, how I make it the most, to be honest. So my strategy has always been to, take the feedback but let me do my thinking to understand how I feel about it and not let as much as possible not let you know the stereotypes define what I should be doing if that makes sense yeah absolutely and it's so easy to internalize the bias that you face that you stop understanding when it becomes a part of you yeah Exactly. The biggest and, and just imagine, right? Like if you keep hearing the same thing over and over and over and over exactly. again, and you start thinking, yeah, of course, that's the norm and I'm the exception to it. Yeah. <laughs> it's about who you want to give the permission to slow down your career because there are a lot of people yeah. already to define what you should be doing at which age. It starts with yeah. when girls should start getting married. It starts from yes. there. <laughs> yeah. And then, yeah, it continues. It's a chain of events. And it's, it's, and it's also kind of, if you just pause and think about the different ages and the and the bar True. that people have it's very different culture to culture like in india women are you know expected or the recommended age to get married is you know uh, you know before your 30s or the exactly. kids before your 30s or whatever <laughs> in the us it's 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 literally the opposite i've seen very few people you know have kids before their 30s they mostly have in their 30s like so even that i'm saying is there's no standard age for that so it's very hard to satisfy everybody <laughs> it is right? and as you yeah, said it all yeah. comes down to what you and your family are okay with and as long as exactly. they are the ones who you care about and they are okay with it you don't have anything to worry yeah. but yeah you have to draw a line between whom where you will stop listening to people and whom you'll give the permission for messing up with yeah. your career yeah yeah, but the hardest thing for me was learning how to respond mm. uh, because it, it, the easier thing over there was to just stay silent. True. But, but at some point I was like, well, if I'm keeping quiet, they're going to say the same thing to somebody else. Yeah. Right. So I was like, how do I respond in a non condescending manner, but also kind of educate them that there was some sort of a subtle bias over there. Right. So I had to really like talk to a lot of, you know, other women, talk to leaders and understand how did you process this like how do you respond to situations and figure out my own way of responding that is authentic enough and doesn't come as you know condescending but also makes them pause and think about what they just said or did yeah and i think that's how we can tackle bias in the industry and as men and women everyone is responsible for holding yeah. others accountable for this because yeah. it's important to speak up and it's the hardest yeah. thing to do yeah yeah Especially Absolutely. when women are always, women are always called aggressive. Yeah, I'm glad so, that you're so vocal about this. And I saw that you also created a hashtag uh, about mom in tech on LinkedIn. And there were several moms participating in it and talking yeah. about the struggles that they face every day, which is, it's yeah. not apparent to everyone. It's not, it's not apparent at all. You know, that, that's my, that's the thing that I want to raise part. more awareness. True. You know, like I really want to raise more awareness about, hey, you know, it's, it's, and it's not just about you know I have a lot of men coming and saying why are you just talking about moms what about dads I'm like hey, just because I'm talking about mom doesn't mean <laughs> dads don't do enough it's, it's like the whole like what about us I'm like let's not do that please you know like I have so many men come and say for any post I write about women they come and say what about men let's focus on gender <laughs> equality I'm like dude like I can't really under, I can understand maybe 
but i'm not a man so i there are enough problems women face i'm just writing about women <laughs> let it be you write about man i can support your post i am a good ally you know but just don't come and you know interject the conversation by just saying what about men yeah right it it it's not mutually exclusive you know mm. so I, and i just wanted to you know through everything i write about linkedin i i i i think about okay like what are the things that i want people to know what are the things that i want you know people who are not moms to know or people who are ma- men managers to know because there are a lot of nuances that go into a mom showing up at work every single day true and i and and, and we try to mask a lot of it because mm. again with a smile societal, yeah. societal norms say that but that's not professional you know but that's you know you're not supposed to show up like that you're not supposed to be like that you're not you're supposed to mask all these things because if you show it openly then you're not clear your gender but these are all the narratives that i heard mm. right but i'm like but that's not okay at all you know when i'm sitting at my house and spending 8 to 10 hours working a very integral part of that is what goes on behind the other side of the door right and why is it not okay for you to know what's happening right why is it not okay for you to understand the trade offs that moms go through every single day to show up at work and yet do a pretty good job at their job at their roles yeah and all of right? this when each one of us is in some way a part of all of this right exactly. we've seen it in our exactly. families we'll see yeah. it later in the future yeah. right so i am not comfortable with masking and having or oh, this is where my personal life stops and this is where my professional life starts especially i think in the last two years if it's proven anything it's that hey it's it's there are far more overlap than we all anticipated and gave yeah. <laughs> right so i am very you know um open in sharing the struggles that moms go through and um I know a lot of people are not comfortable saying those things but I just you know I I would like to be a microphone for them and that's exactly what I do on LinkedIn you know I up level the stories that uh, that are shared to me either through events or through private messages or through one on one chats and I raise more awareness about the types of biases moms face and raise more awareness about the types of issues they have to you know navigate every single day because with with more you know discussion comes more awareness and hopefully with more awareness there's less of these issues happening true i'm hoping that we can normalize all of this in in the ways that we can through our journey yeah yeah absolutely so coming back to the the point where you said it's it's we don't want to internalize the bias that we face but then there are all of these narratives going around and one of those is women don't take enough credit for the work that they do and i've i've seen this all around me i'm sure you've encountered it personally as well that a lot of times we feel that okay i'm i've done this work but then we credit it to the team we don't project yeah. our accomplishments well and yeah. around 60% of women end up doing doing that they don't take credit for the work that they're doing which men easily do Yeah. right so what would you suggest are some of the strategies that women can follow uh, to project it in a way that it doesn't feel like condescending or it doesn't feel like bragging about their bragging. own brand? yeah yeah this is i think a, a recurring thing that we keep hearing over and over mm. again right that women don't take enough credit for the work that they're doing women you know want to be 101% perfect before yeah. you know sharing their work while while men are like 60 70% perfect and they're just like you know talking about it all the time yeah see when when i think about this from again my own personal experiences again there's there's a cultural attribute tied to this too right because when i was growing up i was always thought to be be humble mm. you know be <laughs> uh believe in the system and even in schools i would say like you know it's 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 you're always like supposed to as you as you put it do the work and let the system take care of its the yeah. rest let your work right? speak for yourself exactly right like do your best and leave the rest to whomever you know so uh, these things definitely again play a role right because all of a sudden when you are in you know in, in the corporate world there's a system that has way too many people to you know look at what each person has contributed the system is there there's a lot of layers between you doing the work and the system noticing you true right Yeah. So and we all know there are still a lot of biases that exist in whatever system you pick. Right? So what happens when women just do the work silently and leave the rest to the system? The system here can be managers or their employers or yeah. whoever it is. 
right, organizations, right? What happens is sometimes, I mean, a lot of managers, a lot of people are well intentioned. They do want to give credit when it's due. They do want to recognize people, but they, they're just dealing with a lot themselves. Right? Mm. And it's not really possible for a single person to understand all the nuances that went into, let's take a product, right? It's really hard for them to understand all the nuances that went into the product shipping, mm. right? They're not going to be keeping tabs of how many people have you enabled and empowered and helped to yeah. get their jobs done. You, you have to do that. Like it is literally your you know, responsibility to make sure that you educate the other person on your accomplishments, right? And you stand up for what you believe your work. Mm. Right. So for me, when I was, you know, much younger in my career, um, I, I, I was very uncomfortable because I'm like, yeah, I did those things, but I don't want to come off as, you know, somebody who's boasting. I don't want to yeah. come off as somebody who is, you know, um, always raising their hand up. You know, I was very uncomfortable because it was, you know, not in line with what I've learned, what I was taught mm. in school. And, and, you know, so it, it took a while to, again, understand, okay, but if I'm not taking charge of my career, who, who is? Right? A lot of women that I looked up to gave me this, you know, solid advice every day. Like, you are literally the only person who can change the course of your career. Mm. Everybody else can support in some way or the other, but nobody, do not let anybody, you know, shape your career. You shape your career. Yeah. Right. And if you if you want to take charge of your career, then you speak up. Mm. Right. And and I think that really resonated with me. Like I had to really process that saying, yeah, of course, like if I want to do these things and I, I always believe in pursuing a multidimensional career. Like I, I think my job, I, I, yeah. I love being a product manager. I, I'm so glad I kind of found my calling at a very young age. Um, I, I love every aspect of product management. Like I love the, you know, envisioning. I love coming up with a strategy, dreaming big and corralling an entire team and like, you know, making it happen and then seeing mm. people. Like, I love every aspect of it, but that's one part of my career. I don't define my job to be my entire career. True. Right? So for me, I am. I also love music and I want to do things over there. I love public speaking and that's a very, very integral part of my career. I love, you know, advocating and working for women in tech organizations and that's also a part of my career. And the problem with, Letting others define is, you know, they only understand one aspect of my career. They don't have visibility nor understand my aspirations on the other aspects of my career. Yeah. Right. So what, what becomes important, you know, at least what I learned was, hey, I have to figure out how I'm going to shape up each dimension of my career and what it means at different stages of my life. Mm. Right. So once I, I think, understood that and, and, and processed what I was hearing in corporate America and how it was different from what I heard for the <laughs> first couple of decades of my life, then it became execution. Right? Okay, mm-hmm. how do I take charge of my career? Like what are you know some strategies, as you mentioned, to, to speak up? So there are a couple of practical things that I picked up in my career, right? One mm-hmm. is um, I keep a log of everything that I accomplished. So true. That's so important. Um, because, you, because our lives are busy, we forget. Mm. And if you don't remember, then you can't write it in your, you know, I don't know, annual review cycle or promotion yeah. cycle or whatever it is that happens in your company, right? So at least, you know, figure out the right scope and granularity and then keep track. Like monthly, I do a self-retro and I started doing this like a while ago, I would say. So every month I block 30 minutes of my calendar and I do a self-retro of what happened in the past month. Yeah. Right. And I write down, I just jot down, okay, this happened, this happened. I helped, you know, tackle this escalation or I helped this person, you know, I, I mentored XYZ people, I started this, you know, uh, initiative, uh, yeah. initiative, right? So whatever it is, keep a log of it. Mm. And then, you know, it helps in two purposes. One, it helps you write a good end of your narrative of your 360 degree accomplishments. And secondly, it helps you, you know, measure the things that you like doing, things that you don't like doing, things that you're good at doing. And you yeah. need to have some sort of a metric system for your own. Otherwise, you're just like shooting in the dark, right? So this, you know, self retro really helped. And secondly, I also learned the fine balance of giving credit, thanking the team generously for everything that they do, empowering my team and recognizing the contributions of every single member of the team. But at the same time, also taking credit for the work that I have done. Hmm. And that's a very, very It's hard... a very tricky skill. Yes. Exactly. Right? So that's a hard <laughs> yeah. skill to build. And I've, you know practiced it several times mm. over the years I would say where I am very generous in thanking my team members like I that's the but that's my nature by default 
right? I, I am, you know, I, I feel like if somebody has gone out of their way and done something, they definitely need to be acknowledged and thanked for, even if it is their job. Yeah. At, right. So, and I also this the, the idea of you know the the aspect of thanking and giving credit actually helps build team morale. Yeah. Right. So I'm very generous in recognizing people and you know thanking them, but at the same time I also you know uh, take credit for what I've done with the right people. Like you don't have to go and tell everybody in every meeting that yeah I did that. No, <laughs> the only people who need to know need to know. That's it. Right. So, and that's where when you combine the first and the second tip that I said, where you have a good log of everything that you're doing and you're you know, clear on the contributions that you have had and yet you are giving credit to everybody, but telling the people who need to know mm. that, hey, these are the things that I have helped, supported, right? Uh, the, and also that, that helps. And also, you know, as I grew in my career, a lot of um, my focus was around enabling my team. Yeah. Right. So when you're much younger in your career, you are a lot more doer. Mm. right and then when you start becoming more senior and more tenured like you 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 also you still do but you also start becoming a supporter yeah right like how are you empowering your team how are you you know supporting your team to achieve more so right so it, the narrative also shifts a little bit more so it, it, it kind of you know falls in line i would say yeah so i think it's it's very nice how you put it building the right message and conveying it to the right people right and yeah. that that's very important and i think another important benefit of the self retro exercise that you mentioned is it would help you to gain more conf- confidence of the work that you're doing because absolutely. you can look back on that on the days that you feel low absolutely absolutely yeah and that's something that i do which has helped me a lot on my low days where i think that i'm not good enough and that keeps coming yeah. back right because we've been yeah. fed all of that during our yes. upbringing and all that it comes it keeps coming back but then you refer to that So it's, it's yes. a wonderful exercise. I'm glad Absolutely. you. Absolutely, I'm glad you're doing that. <laughs> <laughs>